I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and this is Sustainable Hawaii, streaming, streaming live every Tuesday at noon at thinktechhawaii.com. My guest today is Kyle Dada, managing partner of Ulupono Initiative, a social impact investment firm whose ambitious mission is to improve the quality of life in Hawaii through investments in locally produced renewable energy, food, and waste management. Kyle received a master's degree in public and private management from the Yale School of Organization and Management, as well as a master's degree in environmental science in resource economics from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. His previous positions include CEO of US Biodiesel Group, Managing Director of Research and Consulting at the Rocky Mountain Institute, and a Vice President at Booz Allen Hamilton, where he served as Managing Director of the Asia Energy Practice and the U.S. Utility Practice. He currently serves on the Board of Directors for Blue Planet Foundation and the Johnson Ohana Charitable Foundation. He's also National Co-Chair of the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders. Welcome back to the show, Kyle. Very good to be here, Kirsten. Last time you were on was in November, and I had you talking about your investments at Ulupono in food security and agriculture investments. So this time I'd like to focus on energy, particularly since I read your illustrious background and credentials in energy. So Kyle, you know that, uh, or everyone, our audience knows, of course you do, that we have the 100% renewable energy goal by 2045 in our statutes. What do you think is our potential for reaching that goal? Well, technically, uh, we can achieve that goal today with the technologies that we have and still maintain system reliability. So that's the good news. Uh, then it becomes a question of, will that be affordable to everyday people? How much more will that cost and what benefits will we get? And as we look at it, we find that in all of our counties, especially the neighbor islands that have a lot of renewable resources relative to their population, that in fact it will be a cheaper solution when you take into consideration the risk of fossil fuels. Because many of you remember in 2008 when prices hit $145, all of us suffered a lot. Our energy bill went up by billions. And what renewables do is you essentially take away the risk of fossil fuels by putting in the money up front for the solar system or the wind farm, and they don't have to worry about the risk of the fossil fuels you're displacing. And when you take those benefits into consideration, we actually find that on a risk-adjusted basis, it's more affordable, and it appears to what customers want. It's also more affordable because we've taken on a lot more of that power generation ourselves in Hawaii. Maybe talk to us a little bit about how that's made uh, the energy scenario different. Yeah, so it's, it's good to, for your listeners just to recap a little bit about the history of the industry and so to understand where we are now and understand where we're going. So when the industry was formed over 100 years ago, the utilities were given a monopoly but also had to undergo regulation because we wanted to allow them to have the capital to put up the wires and build the power plants. And then about 30 years ago, we decided, you know, it would be good if other people could build power plants too so we changed the rules to allow other people to build power plants through competitive bids. And so you had another source of capital come into the system. Now with technology, not just for the solar panels, but for your smart meters, for your smart thermostats, for your, your car, for all the devices in your home, you want the customer to be able to put all these devices in using their capital to also be a major contributor to the total system. And that's where we are now. That's the new frontier that we're looking at. How does that new group, the customer that's also a producer and a consumer, how does they interact with the utility? How do we change the rules so that everybody can really win? And speaking of changing the rules, uh, we just went through this merger process where Nextera was trying to merge with Hawaiian Electric Company. And the PUC, the Public Utility Commission, turned it down, did not um, approve it. How is that going to change this scenario? Because we expected a huge infusion of capital with NextEra, and that's now not coming. Right. Well, you know, it is true that the amount of capital we need for the whole system to let go of our old fossil power plants, modernize the grid, and put in all this, these new renewable 
plants, either at the utility scale or at your home, cost more than our local utility can afford to pay on its balance sheet. That is true. And I think if we had next year had come with their plan 15 years ago, we would have thrown Plumeria at their feet because we wanted the local utility to really embrace renewables and do that. And it's true they have the balance sheet to do this. The issue is that there is such a strong aspiration from the new technology suppliers and the customers, the regulators, and the government to start to embrace the business model for this century, not last century, which really involves the consumer and the utility and the independent power producers, all three of them. Uh, and that's where I think where NextEra had a challenge meeting uh, what we would define as the public interest. And so that's why I think the merger failed ultimately because they were looking at a different model that would have gotten us there. Now, I think there's an opportunity for all the stakeholders to really work together to define the model that is going to work here, that we can do on our own. We don't need a third party to come in. Uh, but that will, everybody will benefit. The utility will benefit, policy members will benefit, the customers will benefit of all economic classes. Uh, and the environment, of course, will benefit. Now, th that new model you've somewhat described, but is there a way you could encapsulate it for our audience? Uh, what would you call that new model? Well, uh, I think it falls under the general heading of 21st century utility. And what that really embodies is it embraces the technologies that we now have in this century. And, and these technologies really have changed our lives. We are fundamentally interconnected in a different way. And that's the essence of the business model change, is that because the customers are so interconnected and can be interconnected, they literally can form virtual power plants, which is an extraordinary concept. It's something that uh, we wrote about in 2002, and now the technology is, has come of age where we're doing it now, today. Can you explain that technically? Sure. So in the traditional power plant, you have a power generator that then uh, you provide fuel to it, or you have a windmill or a solar plant, and it sends electricity down the wires to the rest of the grid. So it's one, it's one clear plant that's tied into the control room. In the virtual power plant case, you're taking all the devices in the home, the solar panels, all the flexible loads, your dishwasher, your air conditioner, your refrigerator, your car, if it's electrical vehicle, everything, uh, and you're allowing that to be controlled uh, by uh, a system that then allows the loads to up or down or power to be provided to the system when it needs it or, or drawn from the system. And essentially it creates, through lots and lots of customers, thousands and thousands, a, a virtual power plant. And this is not science fiction. It's not a visionary thing. Uh, it exists at a very large scale in Germany today. In the northern German uh, area of Hamburg and Hanover, there's a company called Licht Licht, and it's the largest retail utility in Germany. Uh, and it's created something called Schwarm Power, which has reached uh, a thousand megawatts or a gigawatt scale of virtual power. And to give everyone a sense of how big that is, the all of Oahu is 1,800 megawatts. That's 1.8 gigawatts. So this is a power plant that is bigger than all the neighbor islands combined and as big as half of Oahu made up entirely of customers. And that is, not, and it's cheaper than the central power plant that is displaced. And that's an extraordinary thing. That's how far technology has progressed. And I think that's one of the solutions, not the only side. The utility still has to modernize the grid and we still are going to need some centralized power plants. And we'll probably need some degree of decarbonization of fuels and modernization. So decarbonization of fuels meaning emphasis on renewable. Well, it's a, probably a combination of things. Uh, because the energy system does not exist in isolation. The energy system in electricity, which is where our targets are, uses the bottom of the refinery. But one of the questions we have to ask is when we take out the bottom of the refinery, the refineries are going to close. So what do we want to do to replace them? We could just bring in tankers and have tank farms. Uh, but I think what we're going to see and where the rest of the world is going is the rest of the world is, is decarbonizing because of climate change and probably applying natural gas to the transportation sector and the marine sector 
and then a small amount of the power sector just to, for the modern turbines to play well with the variability of wind and solar. So, so there'd be an easing in, in other words, we'd use some of the fossil fuels in... Right. in it's a transitional cities. thing. It's like yeah. a 20... What you're seeing in most of the world is a, is a 20 or 30 year transition playing out where we're taking out the highest carbon things, coal. Right. We're trying to figure out what to do with the old nuclear plants that are, are low carbon but dangerous. Uh, and you're seeing this, this shifting to renewables backed by natural gas as opposed to the other side, which was natural gas backed backed by renewables, now it's the other way. It's really renewables backed by natural gas in the power sector, but also, and then in the transportation sector, you're seeing the electrification of vehicles. Because here's the question. We have, we bring in 45 million barrels of oil equivalent every year to the state, and mostly oil, but other fossil fuels. So we have to think about how are we gonna take that all the way down, not just in power, which is one third, but when we do that, how does it affect the rest of the system? What do we replace it with? What do we transition? And how do we integrate the system for, to think about the whole energy system? Right. And I know that Ulupona was looking at that. I think you had a study that may have been completed now on the status of the electric utility. Yeah, we've, we've done a number of, of analyses of working with uh, UH, Dr. Fripp, and of course, teaming with Blue Planet and many other stakeholders. And then the utility sometimes itself the, the essence of the situation is we have choices. I think, you know, during the merger, the utility expressed one choice, which is let's really have a wholesale switch to LNG and we'll back it up with renewables and eventually sort of swap it out 30 years from now. Uh, there was another set of choices saying, well, maybe we go all renewable, but how will that work? And this course, an intermediate hybrid choice where you, you do mostly renewables, but you, you transition through a process. So we've looked at those choices uh, and looked at the cost of those choices, but also the relative risk they impose. And what we found is for a very, very small amount of additional cost, you can take away lots of the cost of, lots of the risk of fossil fuels. And as a society, that's probably a better choice. Uh, so we, we wanted to was the study published? I know it was we, also for we provided as, it was We provided it as inputs to the, the power supply planning process to be transparent. and Which is still a docket that remains even after the PUC it, didn't accept the merger, right? Yes, so it's still an open uh, plan. It hasn't been completed. Uh, there is a number of parties, ourselves included, and virtually all the other parties, uh, mostly environmental groups, community groups, all the renewable companies, the gas company, the state, that want to reach out to the utility to say, hey, we need to really pull our numbers on the table, make sure we use an objective planning model, uh, and just see what our choices are, and then what are the trade-offs around okay. the choices. Terrific. When we come back, we'll talk with Kyle a little further on where Ulupono is investing in energy. We'll be right back. You're watching SyncTech Hawaii, which streams live on SyncTechHawaii.com, uploads to YouTube.com, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Alelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Hi, I'm Ray Starling, and I am co-host for Hawaii's Wednesday afternoon, State of Clean Energy. And with me today is Leslie Cole Brooks, and she's going to tell you what's happening this month with our shows. Hi, everybody. I'm Leslie Cole Brooks, the Executive Director of the Distributed Energy Resources Council. And this month is the focus is on distributed energy resources. We just had a great show on smart grid technologies. And the rest of the month, we're going to discuss storage, different strategies, microgrids. And then we're going to have live man and woman on the street from Verge. So it's really exciting, very informative, um, lively, and just worth doing. So. See you next Wednesday. Bye. Hi, we're back with Kyle Dada, Ulupono Initiative, and we're talking about what they're going to invest in energy. What is the scenario you see for Ulupono's investments? And you mentioned natural gas, so I'm wondering, is that an area you see as right for uh, social impact investing? Well, it's probably not uh, going to be directly one of our investments, but we will be investing in renewable natural gas in partnership with the gas company. Uh, because we, we believe that there's a, a portion of the gas stream that can be created here from both our waste products and some biomass uh, and, of course, landfill gas and whatnot that we 
has a, an important role to play. And we're very, very big believers in what's called combined heat and power. And that's known as cogeneration technically, where you are essentially displacing not just the electrical load in, say, a hotel, uh, but also the heat load for heating and cooling and laundry and whatnot. And it's so efficient that we think that's a very, very good use of the fossil molecule when we're going to use it. Uh, and it I also plays well with renewables. Have you folks also invested in the cold water air conditioning in yes. Waikiki? Yes. One of the most important things to always invest in is efficiency. And the number one efficiency project in our state is Honolulu Seawater Air Conditioning, which is really a district cooling. It's using seawater to replace all the cooling towers and all the air conditioners and all the buildings downtown. And, and I understand that's actually how it was done many years ago, that coming into this very street, up Bishop Street, uh, that there were a couple of the buildings that were cooled that way. Yes, and uh, I think you're right. And it's very, very common in the Nordic countries and Sweden. It's, it's, it's nothing to be scared of. It's, it's really actually plumbing. It's literally plumbing. It's cold seawater. Uh, and, and so and it's, and it's environmentally safe for the oceans because you're recycling, like bringing it back. So efficiency is an important project. We very much believe in investing on the customer side. So there's many really innovative technologies uh, around demand response. One of the most innovative is shifted energy, which is essentially takes all the water heaters and allows them to, as I was saying earlier, charge and discharge depending on what the grid needs. So they become part of that virtual power plant I was talking about, but it's very inexpensive because most people, many people still have electric water heaters. And of course, we and, have and that's, Sorry, that's, I just I want to clarify. So that's very much dependent, though, on the smart metering technology in order for that to be able to happen? Yes, yes. We are, we are in favor of the application of smart metering technology because that's essentially a grid modernization tool that allows the utility to play nicely with its customers and vice versa. That is the, you need that gateway into the customer's devices and vice versa. So the customers right. can sell to the grid. But the essence of why this all works is the, the ability of our control systems to understand what's out there and send signals to it and to get signals back. Right. And you need a meter to both do that, but also to fairly charge or pay for the services used. So is that an area also that Ulupono is investing in? Well, we don't have to invest in smart meters because actually it's a utility function. They already have a proposal that. We're very supportive of that proposal. We'll certainly invest in the things on the other side of the meter. We're clearly very interested in investing in the larger scale renewables, whether it's, it's biomass, geothermal, wind, or solar. All of these technologies at this point are very proven. And what we see is that the neighbor islands can truly, within a decade, be at essentially 100%. Also, the, the new battery tech- In a decade? In a decade. I want to note that. That's really yeah, ambitious. Very That's enough. exciting. It's, it's, it truly is uh, possible it's, and, and affordable. The other thing, which I think is a, an important element, of course, is storage, where you have both pump storage, which is really moving water up and down uh, 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 elevation, so you're using that kinetic storage of like a giant battery. Uh, and there's places in, in most of the counties where are so mountainous where that makes a lot of sense. It's environmentally appropriate, often in former... Uh, hydro. Well, former hydro or former ponds that used to be part of the, the plantation or the agricultural infrastructure or the ranches. Uh, as well as, of course, there's battery technologies, including uh, one by our very own entrepreneur, Hank Rogers, mm -hmm which is using a, a more advanced version of lithium with cobalt, so it runs cooler than the, the normal sort of Tesla-type batteries, which is, of course, more beneficial to the home. You're not adding any more right. energy load. Now, we had Hank and, uh, on the show talking about the Blue Lion. Right. And it's, uh, I haven't followed its success, no. though, commercially. No. Is that... Uh, it's starting... I think what we're seeing is it's all starting to move. Uh, you're, you're, we're in an interesting situation now which is really the, the, both the challenge and the opportunity. For the customers, in many cases, especially in the neighbor islands where rates are much higher than Oahu, it actually makes sense in many cases to defect, to leave the grid, which is not necessarily the best social outcome, but it makes sense for them as individuals. It also makes sense across all the counties never to connect. That's how, that's how affordable microgrids are. But they're only affordable because the utility has not taken the steps to turn off their old fossil plants that are very inefficient, modernize with just the minimum amount of fossil needed and really embrace the renewables because it is true, it is cheaper for the utility to provide that, but when they don't, the customers vote with their wallets and their feet. Exactly. And so that's what we're seeing. 
Yeah, so if we have that possibility, and we're seeing that happen already, and indeed we know that the probably the best example of microgrid, uh, at least in Hawaii, is at Camp Smith. So mm -hmm. we have the Department of Defense taking that mm -hmm. route also. What's, what is it going to take now, without this infusion of capital, to get our monopoly utility to do that? I, I think it's all about choice and ultimately about trust. Uh, I think part of what, you know, we had a big scrap over next era between the utility and all the stakeholders. I think it's time for us to say, okay, we had that. Let's now move forward together. And how can we find solutions where the utility, the ratepayers, the customers, public policy, the environment all win? Uh, and that's important. That, that dialogue needs to happen. And that requires trust. It requires extending trust to the other parties, especially to, most importantly, kind of the emerging executive team uh, of the, 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 that are inside HECO, because they are the next generation of leadership. And they are far more open-minded than the prior generation because of just their youth and their energy. So it's an important time to kind of pick up a new chapter in this relationship. So that's part of it. Uh, I think the other part is recognizing that we're all going to have to accommodate a new business model. And so that's a lot of change. It's a lot of regulatory change. It's a lot of um, uh, business model change. And we're going to have to strengthen our regulatory institutions and ensure that they are truly uh, have the capacity they need, have the independence they need, because at the end of the day, we have to, our society does best when decisions are made openly, transparently, and whatever we decide, we can buy into because we understand how the decision was made. Specifically, with regard to the regulatory changes, yeah. um, what are some of the major dockets or, or changes that we might see also in the legislature coming up this fall that are required to make that happen? Well, there's... There's a number of changes that will happen. Most of them will be in, with the, the Public Utility Commission itself. There will be some things that need legislative change. I mean, clearly, we all understand that the way we defined the renewable portfolio standard, which essentially sets the targets and the quota for the utility to meet, actually technically was uh, misdesigned a bit. So uh, has a double count in the formula, and we probably need to fix that. And, we, and that's a couple of loopholes. We probably need to close those. So that at least when we hit 100%, it really does mean 100%. Because right now, technically, we, we could be at 100% and actually only have 80% renewables on the mm -hmm. system. Uh -huh. So we have to, that's a legislative fix. And we hope the legislator and the governor will lead that charge. At the PUC, the essence of the, the discussion is how do we actually make the following principle real? If a customer should pay for the services it uses, but it should get paid for the services it provides. That's simple. Very, very simple concept. Very equitable, totally fair, but making that real in a, in a small utility, in a small place, with that incredible transactional cost, that's where I think the art comes in, and that's why we need the collaboration. And so what is that solution? Well, it's not one solution. Uh, it really is around how do we price grid services that's the essence, and whether you buy them or you sell them. And given that we'd, we're not going to be like New York, we're not going to be like California or Pennsylvania, we're not going to have big markets for people to bid into these services, so we won't be able to do that. How do we, on an engineering level, estimate the cost of these, given they change over time during the day, mm -hmm. to say, here's a reasonable estimate that we can all live with mm -hmm. for the next five years. Let's try this. And you update it periodically. But, but the pushback we always get, the argument about um, really allowing for continued expansion of distributed generation, particularly when you know, the issue has been over solar on people's rooftops, is that now net metering uh, is gone. And the argument is very much that if we allow uh, those folks to get the fair market value or the exact value of what they produce, that puts the onus of the rest of the grid, the rest of the utility wow. lines, on the public that can't afford those improvements on their rooftops or solar or wind on the top of their buildings. So the I understand the, the concern. The principle I espoused eliminates that concern because, of course, if you're paying for what you use and you're only getting paid for the value what you receive, what you're providing, then there's no equity issues. So that's, that's why the principle is so important. But to the other point, there's two other things that are very important to think about in terms of equity. I think for almost a century, we in Hawaii have defined equity as, as equality of outcome. 
everyone gets treated the same. Mm. In the modern age, we have to think of equity as equity of opportunity. Everybody had the same opportunity to participate. Whether they chose to or not was their decision. They had to have the right to choose. They had to have the resources to be able to make them have that. And I think that's what community solar is all about. The knock on solar was it's just a rich people's thing, which it was in the beginning. Or the same thing with storage. Oh, it'll just be a rich people's thing. But with community solar and with the GEMS program, now we're saying, look, you can be in an apartment, you can be a poor person, you can be a rich person. We're going to give you the financing. So your financing is sometimes off your bill. That's on bill financing. We're going to give you loans when you need it. That's GEMS. We're going to allow the solar plant to be miles away and just buying a little, you're buying your own little panel. So that is that's a quality. That's community solar. Community solar, the, the three programs working together. Right. So that's a quality of opportunity and that's a very, very important thing because then everybody, your auntie, my, my wife's you know, mother has the out in her, her house up in Honana. They have a choice of making that choice with just a, a check of a box. So that is important. So that's a critical element of how to create equity as we go forward. Very, very important question. I'm glad you asked it. And, and so part of your effort at Ulupono, and we only have one minute left, but is social impact investing. So obviously right. all of this has a social impact. Yeah. But looking at that equity issue, I imagine that's something that you're also investing in is, it is. how do we plan for this? How do we pull right. it all together? Right. How do we, as you said, I think in your advertiser article, which was a very nice feature on you, uh, really what you're about is getting people to work together. That's right. And to make change. That's right. That's that right? right. I think we invest in the ability of society to work together, but all, and then we invest in the business models and technologies that we need for everyone to prosper. So we're going to look forward to seeing how you're doing that, and I want to have you back again to give us an update. But this has been Sustainable Hawaii with Kyle Dada, General Partner at Lupono Initiative. And tune in to us again next Tuesday, where we hope to have Celeste Connors with Hawaii Green Growth. Aloha and mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo.